UW360 is proudly supported by Pacific Office Automation, Copy, Print, Workflow, and IT, Problem Solved. Hi everyone, I'm Carolyn Douglas. Welcome to UW360. We're joining you from historic Heck Edmondson Pavilion. This is home to the UW basketball, volleyball, and gymnastics programs. And it's also where we uncovered a story straight out of the hit movie, Moneyball. We'll see how the men's basketball team is using stats and analytics to increase its numbers in the win column. That's coming up a little later in the show. We'll also tell you about a multi-million dollar scam targeting senior citizens and how to avoid it. We'll learn about some exciting new research into stem cell therapies that may one day help patients with spinal cord injuries move again. And we'll see how UW researchers are working to make LED light bulbs greener and cheaper for everyone. But first, what inspires you? Music? Art? Maybe love? A nursing student here at the UW tackled that question in an award-winning essay that earned her a valuable scholarship. Erin Mayofsky shares a story that just might inspire you to find your mountain. Yeah. Did you get some soap? Oh, good job. Good. And Forget to get in between your fingers. Katie Rose Fisher Price knows all about the importance of clean hands. Are there any other places where the germs were left? Today, at Jose Marti School, the University of Washington nursing student is teaching children having clean hands is the first step of staying healthy. Good job, that was awesome. My hands are clean. <laughs> My father's body lies at 29,035 feet, on top of the world's tallest mountain. I was five years old when he died, still so new to the world that he had just left. Nearly 19 years ago, during a wicked storm, Katie's father, Scott Fisher, an expert climber, died atop Mount Everest. Katie doesn't remember a lot about her father, but there is one memory she draws upon daily. I was five years old when he died, still so new to the world that he had just left. Though I remember little else about him, for some odd reason I can recall every detail of his hands. They were giant and rugged, a direct reflection of his profession. At night, those rough, warm hands would pick me up, set me on his lap, and flip through the pages of Dr. Seuss's Oh, The Places You'll Go. I don't remember his voice, but I remember his hands as they stopped on the last page and pointed to their favorite passage, Your Mountain Is Waiting. Years later, Katie would find her mountain in Nepal, the same spot where her father's body still rests, but still inspires, guiding her and helping others, pushing her here to the University of Washington Nursing School. I think I just really learned what it really was to be a nurse when I was there, because it's not about, you know, IVs and stethoscopes. It's about making connections and, and helping, really, is what it is. So, Katie's other mountain is here at the University of Washington, still climbing every day, reaching her goal well, to be a nurse. I think she's going to be a real asset to the nursing profession. She's clearly um, bright. She's a critical thinker. She can think on her feet, but she's also extremely compassionate. Now, when she's not busy in nursing school, she's here in Seattle helping run a mountain guide company called Mountain Madness, a company her father founded 30 years ago. I also noticed his watch is a lot like my watch. We have always talked about Daddy. I mean, from the minute we knew he was missing on the mountain, he's still been part of our lives. We've never not spoken about Daddy, but this is the kind of stuff that it's, it's hard to not have him here because he would be so proud. And he loved his kids so much. If you have soap on your hands, you kind of scratch your palms like this and it gets under your fingers. Katie will graduate from nursing school this spring and she knows in her life there will always be a helping hand, big or small, but never dirty. He was the best of the best. Though my path is a less obvious one, I know with certainty that I have found my mountain. 
That mountain is nursing, and I, like my father, will be the best of the best. Did you get some soap? Katie Rose's award-winning essay from U.S. Medical Supplies was worth $3,500, which will help her pay for her nursing degree here at the University of Washington. When we come back, a warning to seniors about a costly scam circulating the country as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360. Every year, senior citizens lose millions of dollars to the grandparent scam. They get a call from someone whom they believe is their grandchild, who says he or she is in trouble in another country and in desperate need of money. Since many college-age grandchildren travel abroad, it can be easy to fool a well-meaning grandparent. This scam has been around for years, and it's still conning people. Terry Murphy shows us how it works and how to avoid it. It begins with a phone call. Hello. Hi, Grandma, it's me. It ends with the loss of a lot of money. Jeff, you don't sound like yourself. It's called the grandparent scam. Oh, no. And it's costing seniors millions of dollars. I don't really know what to do at this point. There's a vulnerability inside of elders who respond to scams. Wendy Lusbader is an associate professor at UW School of Social Work and the author of several books on aging. I find it heartbreaking, the idea that um, a grandma sitting there in her house gets a call and this person says, this is my, this is your grandson and I need money and could you help me? All right, we'll talk to you later. The grandparents scam all right. is all too common right now. Attorney General Bob Ferguson is on a mission to protect consumers from fraud. It's particularly troubling because it preys on individuals' desire to help out a loved one. And that's exactly what happened to Donald and Ola Mae Nicholas. It's grandkids. You do anything for him. Donald got the phone call. A voice on the other end said, Grandpa, I've had an accident. It's a voice on the other end that might sound familiar, saying, Grandpa or Grandmother, I'm in trouble. I'm your grandchild. I'm overseas. I'm abroad. I'm in trouble with the police. Or I've got an injury of some kind, and I need money fast. What are you in jail for? Believing his grandson's in trouble, Donald wants to help. But in reality, this is the person on the other end of the phone. Grandparents are very protective, and right away they, they'll do anything. Especially. The con man, now serving time, agreed to talk with us if we concealed his identity. You just call and you say, hey, Grandma, how are you? Or, and, then, and then usually they'll be like, oh, is this John? Or they'll give you a name. And then you say, you know, I was here on vacation. Everything was fine. And then I got into an accident. What they do is they say, please don't call the parents because I'm in some kind of trouble, but please send me this money. Wendy Lusbader believes if young adults contacted their grandparents more often, fewer elders would be taken. You're going to be more vulnerable to that as compared to a grandparent who has their grandkids right there. You know what's going on in their lives. You're in touch with them regularly. According to Bob Ferguson, as with any scam, Awareness is the best defense against fraud. Be very skeptical. Anytime someone's calling you up trying to separate you from your money, especially when they ask for a wire transfer, for example, red flags should really go up. Yellow. Once you wire that money, once they collect it, yeah. you're never getting it back. So I think when we look at yeah. scams, we're actually looking at the surface of a very deep problem in the United States about the role of elders. And that's what most interests me as a social worker. How could we address the vulnerability emotionally? Our next story is about some exciting new research happening at the University of Washington involving stem cells and other therapies to help quadriplegics. Mimi Gann shows us how it could change the lives of thousands of people with spinal cord injuries. 
It's a unique global and collaborative approach so that those with spinal cord injuries regain some mobility. And a team at the University of Washington is at the forefront. In 1995, actor Christopher Reeve was thrown from a horse and he suffered a paralyzing spinal cord injury. He soon became a beacon of hope for patients and the medical community by advocating for stem cell research. Chris was very inspiring, but I think the timing just wasn't quite right. I think now we're really approaching a time when things can be done. Two decades later, Dr. Phil Horner, a professor of neurological surgery, is taking a unique and groundbreaking approach to improving the lives of quadriplegics. When, um, People think about spinal cord injury, we often think about making people walk again. And I always thought that was really the main goal. But in the last few years, we've set a very specific goal. And that goal is to try to use a very select approach uh, to try to improve hand function in people who have paralysis. Just a little bit of improvement in hand function is really enabling for a person who has quadriplegia. To improve hand function, Dr. Horner and his team are combining two proven therapies, stem cell therapy and stimulation. Our sort of light bulb moment uh, was, why don't we bring these two technologies together? We get some improvement with physical therapy or stimulation, and we get some improvement with cell therapies. How will they work together? This is uh, six months after injury, right, in this particular sample. Dr. Horner is already seeing promising results. What stimulation does is it coordinates the activity of the brain cells that are still connected with the spinal cord. We kind of get these two systems talking again. We think when we do that in the presence of cells, this period of plasticity will really lead to Im improved uh, hand function. I have hand function issues. My hands don't work as well as I wish they would, especially my right hand. A skiing accident 13 years ago left 58-year-old Bruce Hansen paralyzed from the chest down. After years of intensive physical therapy, he can now walk with a cane. But Bruce still has limited use of his hands, and he's encouraged by Dr. Horner's work. There's real hope that this research and this work is going um, to be able to repair chronic spinal cord injuries. And, you know, first, even if I could get a little more to improve the function of my hand, um, that would be huge. That would be huge. In the meantime, Dr. Horner is partnering with researchers in Spain to conduct the first large-scale safety trials combining stem cell therapy with stimulation. If successful, then human clinical trials are next. There aren't a lot of clinical trials for people who have paralysis. Really, there are very, very few. It's usually just rehab. But I do think we're in a very short timeline to get to clinical therapy or at least safety trial in the next few years. So we're marching forward. I think at a pretty fast pace. Christopher Reeve, Bruce Hansen, and thousands of others who suffer from spinal cord injuries are inspiring researchers to find a cure for paralysis. And the University of Washington is on the cutting edge. I'm inspired by the people that I meet who are just really living their lives and doing amazing things. We're closing in on doing something that will really change the way we think about paralysis. We really think that we're very close. Dr. Horner and Bruce are also teaming up to try to get more state funding for spinal cord research. We commend Dr. Horner for doing what he can to help those with spinal cord injuries. When we come back, a mission to make LED light bulbs greener and cheaper as UW360 continues. Welcome back to UW360. Light bulbs have been brightening our lives since 1879, and they've changed a lot in 125 years. Today, there's an overwhelming number of options in a wide range of prices, including LED bulbs, the most efficient and environmentally friendly bulbs on the market, and some of the most expensive. But now, two UW researchers are developing ways to make LED bulbs greener and cheaper. Rebecca Herr explains how that could affect all of us. Halogen, fluorescent, CFL, LED. With all the options on the market, shopping for lighting these days can be a confusing experience. This is the standard incandescent lamp, familiar to everyone. This lamp was phased out recently by federal standards. 
And on the forefront of this lighting revolution is the LED, or light emitting diode. We have LEDs currently on the market that can produce the same amount of light as that 60 watt incandescent, consuming only 10 watts instead. You don't have to do a lot of math to figure out that uh, LED technology is going to save American households and households in this region a whole lot of energy. Although prices are dropping quickly, LEDs are still more expensive than consumers are used to paying. Turn it on. But a pair of researchers is looking into ways to make LEDs cheaper and at the same time greener to produce. When I turn it on, it just blue. Chang Ching Tu and Ji Hu met as graduate students in electrical engineering at the University of Washington. Together, they formed LumiSans, a company that has developed a way to make an important component of an LED in a much better way. So you can see the yellow um, gel, gel thing on top of the LEDs. The phosphors in an LED illuminate and help control the color of the light you see. Otherwise, the LED would emit a harsh blue light. When I turned it on, um, the phosphorus will absorb part of the blue and convert it to yellow and red. That's why you perceive more, uh, white light. Currently, LEDs on the market contain phosphors made with rare earth elements. These materials are expensive, and the mining process can be hazardous to the environment. Instead, the technology developed by LumiSands uses inexpensive and environmentally friendly silicon to produce phosphors. It's one of the most abundant materials. It's um, basically um, the main component of common sand. LumiSands is still in the research and development stage, but they hope to have their technology in use on the market within the next few years. Hopefully one day we'll be able to provide the market with a rare earth free phosphorus solution for LEDs. Advances in technology are making better quality lighting with higher efficiency. But at the same time, energy needs in the Northwest are growing year after year. That's why Seattle City Light is making huge investments in energy conservation. And lighting is a huge part of Seattle City Light's conservation efforts. Currently, they provide rebates to residential customers on light bulbs and other energy efficient appliances. And on a larger scale, they consult with commercial customers on energy efficient lighting projects. With all of the benefits they provide, the future of LED lighting looks, well, bright. Every six months we have better product, better color rendition, a lower price, and it just keeps on getting better and better. And so. The way lighting is in the future is going to look a lot more like LED. When we come back, playing Moneyball with the UW basketball team as UW 360 continues. Welcome back to UW 360 from Heck Edmondson Pavilion. Coaches are always looking for an advantage over their opponents. Usually that involves players making more baskets. But the UW may have found a secret weapon for success who's never even stepped foot on a court. Rick Garza has the story. Washington Husky basketball game is a pretty exciting place to be. From the fans to the court, there is always something for everyone to experience. Everyone except this man. Sitting courtside right at the end of the officials table, he looks more like an overworked accountant than a basketball fan. But in reality, this is his work. He's watching and might be looking at the numbers to figure out exactly uh, what's happening right now with them. They've, they've got someone on staff to do just that. Right? During the game, I have my laptop in front of me, and I'm logging in pretty much every possession, what's going on per possession. Meet Pavel Sidhu, Washington grad and diehard Husky. Born and raised in Everett, Washington. I went to school here at the University of Washington, got a degree, a business degree. He's also a basketball junkie. 
if he were playing, he'd be considered a gym rat. You know, he loves to watch the game and be involved with the game and break it down. The current buzzword for this is analytics, or in the sports world, Moneyball. I, I leave it at that. Moneyball is the Hollywood film about how baseball's Oakland A's used stats, facts, and figures to help them win. Since then, almost every pro team has hired analysts to crunch obscure numbers. But when it comes to college teams... Not everyone's doing it right now, and we kind of stumbled across it. Uh, Pabell was working in our athletics department, and uh, would, I'd run across him, and he'd say, Coach, uh, just some ideas for you you might want to consider. And As you see him uh, giving one of the assistant coaches a, a numbers there. So for me, the box score tells you 20% of what's going on in the game. There's a whole other 80% of what's not being captured, and that's where I'm trying to capture for the coaches. At first, I, you know, I just kind of listened, but then would go on about my business. But he kept coming. He was kind of relentless, and you could feel his enthusiasm. That commitment finally landed Pavel a full-time job, not only assisting the coaches, but directly helping the UW players. So we give our players scouting reports on their iPads. So we have a profile on their team, offensive, defensively, and then we break down their team on their players. The whole thing is a cool deal for the entire University of Washington. He is like a secret weapon, and other programs around the country have their guys that do this, but not many. And you'd like to keep it that way, then? Absolutely. <laughs> He's already started, though, so by the time someone else does it, uh, he'll be even further along. Pavel will spend the offseason crunching more numbers to prepare for next year. He may also start working with other sports teams, including football. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I enjoy what I do. I'm passionate about it. Um, and that's why I'm always learning. What's next for the Huskies chief number cruncher? He's going to do some work for the football team. We'll check on that this coming fall. And that does it for this edition of UW360 from HECED Pavilion. If you'd like more information on any of the stories you saw today, just head to our website at uwtv.org slash uw360. I'm Carolyn Douglas. Thank you for watching. And we'll see you next time with all new stories from the University of Washington.